Let me try to explain to you spiritually what's going on so even you who are singing don't miss what's going on because it's easy to miss it. First of all, your soul is crying out to be holy and God will use you in a greater dimension if you'll keep away from that which is profane. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying to you? And that goes for everybody. Okay, there's something about what you did today that you're not aware of what you did, so I need to tell you what you did so you don't miss what God is trying to tell you in the midst of you guys playing and singing. Okay, you sung about God's holiness. This is the most important thing. When you say, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you. What do you want to see? What do you think you're going to see? What are you going to see? You're going to see that God is holy, and that ends all questions. Do you know why? Because if you just sing about God's love when the world is coming apart at the seams and it's caving in on you, if you just see God as love, you're going to say, I don't understand God. Right? When you're in a relationship and somebody loves you and they hurt you, what do you say? I don't understand. You're supposed to love me. You understand? But if God is holy, there's no question. Because that means he's perfect. And anything that happens, you have to accept with joy. Do you understand what you're singing? This is what the body of Messiah is missing. They're missing it. If you didn't feel that, my condolences to you. Please, if you didn't feel any of that, please, there's something in the way. You have a God or other gods. Please go home or now and cry out to God to see him in his holiness. Because if you didn't get it, you, you, you know, it, I'm not saying justification is not what I'm talking about. Okay? This is not a salvation station. Okay? If you're saved, great. But I'm telling you, you should have such a desire after that for sanctification. It's all, and, and, and I got news for you. That's what, that's what this holiday is all about. It says here, when the Lord has taken his throne, and I'm just going to give this to you, Psalm 97, because it was pressing on me during the whole worship set. Listen to me. Adonai is king. Let the earth rejoice. The Lord has taken his throne. Let the many coasts and islands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. You know what that's saying? Guys, look up here. Clouds and thick darkness. Do you know what the psalmist is saying? He's saying we don't know him. We don't really know him. Even those of you who think you know him, how little we know of God. How little do we know of God? Righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. Finally, fire goes out before him, setting ablaze his foes on every side. His flashes of lightning light up the world. The earth sees and it trembles. The mountains melt like wax in the presence of the Lord. The heavens declare the righteousness and all people shall see his glory. Everything is humbled except for God. Everything is taken down. All who worship images will be put to shame. Those who make their boast in worthless idols, bow down in him, all you God. Zion hears and is glad. Adonai, the daughters of Judah, are rejoicing at your rulings and your commandments. For you, Adonai, most high over all the earth. Finally, he's El Elyon. You who love Adonai hate evil. He keeps his faithful servants safe. He rescues them from the power of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. And here's the surprise ending. Rejoice and I don't know you righteous and give thanks on recalling his holiness. You would think it would end with give thanks on recalling his love or his mercy. But no, what, what he's saying, the psalmist, is we were excluded because he was holy. Now we're included. You follow? You follow? We're clothed in the righteousness of Messiah. We wear the garment of salvation. We have put that on by the incredible grace of God because your God is completely and unequivocally holy. Forget Hanukkah. You just got the Hanukkah message. That's really what it's about, guys. It's just good to hear the voice of the Lord. Yeah. It's just good to be in, in communion and, and be, be communicating with God. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. It's great to read scripture and it's beautiful, but it's so nice to hear his voice. Yeah. And, and they've always heard it. Adam heard it. And Moses heard it. And Joshua heard it. And Samuel heard it. And the prophets heard it. 
And then we had Yeshua to, to come as the prophet, not to speak for God, but to speak as God. And we heard it. And now we have the Holy Spirit, not outside, but inside. And there's no reason why you should be hearing it unless there's something wrong with the communication. Something's not right. Well, that was good for me. I'm just saying, I come to serve, but it's not so terrible. To, you know, that was good for me. Um, is anybody familiar with the, with the well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask this on behalf of my wife. Look, the, we always talk about the miracle of Hanukkah, right? Yes? Come on, I know you weren't raised in this culture. Look, culturally we're different. In so many ways. I mean, there's, there's culture all over the world. When I've gone to all these places, there's a different culture. And although in Messiah there's no black or white, clearly we have black people and we have white people. And believe me, after living in Macon for 13 years, there is a difference in culture. Yes. Now, thankfully, I was raised in the Bronx in the project. So I, I was involved in every culture there is. But there's a, there's a culture in Judaism. And most Jews today, are cult. there's nothing wrong with being a cultural Jew. It's nice to be a religious Jew as well, but a culture. So we have a different culture. So we always speak about the miracle of Hanukkah, right? You've heard that? The miracle of Hanukkah. It was miraculous. I think there's a mystery of Hanukkah. And let me share with you a slide. How the heck do you spell it? Well, you go with number four, sweetheart, that's what Webster goes with. But in reality, there's no such because, because the word is transliterated. It's not a translation, so it, it, can't, it can't be. So that's the end of the mystery. But also, um, I, I think the miracle of... Is anybody familiar with what I have in this, in this piece of aluminum foil? My wife's made about a thousand of these. I feel like I live in a wok. Um, the whole house is full of oil. Don't even come with a match because it will go up. Um, <laughs> Is anybody familiar with this? Come on, you guys are familiar with fried potatoes. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> this is a latka. Latka is, is, a, is a Yiddish word. You know, it means a... Now, anybody ever seen the movie um, Sling Blade in 1996? So, so what does Jewish people, people in the South, and Billy Bob Thornton have in common? Like them red and fried potatoes, I reckon. <laughs> Uh, if you didn't see the movie, you're obviously not laughing. If you did, it's really funny. Um, but the miracle of Hanukkah is that my people, for 20 centuries, has been eating this artery-clogging food, and we're still here. I think that's <laughs> the real, in case you get hungry. That's the real miracle of Hanukkah, and nobody makes a better latke. Almost my mom, nobody made a better latke than my mom, but my wife is, is, is there, if not... If not, maybe better? Better? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All week she's making jelly donuts, frying jelly donuts, you know, frying jelly donuts, frying potatoes. I've eaten about a thousand of these things. I'm telling you, I couldn't find a suit to put on today. Just couldn't find a suit to put on. And she keeps saying they're organic and they're organic. So I said, then I'll have an organic heart attack. Then when I'm in the box, everybody look, look, he's an organic cadaver. Look how good he looks. Okay, let me, let me give you Webster's definition of, of Hanukkah. Not yet. Um, yeah, hold on. It's a Jewish festival lasting eight days, celebrated from the 25th day of the month of Kislev to the second day of Tevet in commemoration of the rededication of the temple by the Maccabees following their victory over the Syrians, the Seleucid army under Antiochus IV, characterized chiefly by the lighting of the menorah on each night of the festival, which is, which is fairly accurate. I mean, that, that is a textbook definition. Overall, to me, it's, it's, it's such an ultimate, like, David and Goliath story. Really, it's a crazy story if you follow it through. I mean, some Jewish people said, this is the story of our feast. They attacked, we won, let's eat. And I think it's kind of funny, but, you know, I don't really find it funny because thousands and thousands and thousands of people Men, women, and children lost their lives in the battle. 
And this thing wasn't, the Hanukkah wasn't just a, it wasn't like they came out and they said, we'll, we'll stand for you, God, and then they won a victory. It was years and years and years the battle went on in the Hasmonean dynasty, years and years and years. So I don't, I don't find it light when people lose their life, okay? Especially they lost their life so you could have the word of God. Make no mistake, and I'll show you. Make no mistake, if you've never been thankful to the Jewish people as a Christian, I think that you have read the Bible totally incorrectly. Maybe somebody wasn't showing you this, they didn't highlight it for you, I get it. I know we're all marinated in, in our different religions and our religious persuasions. But the people of Israel were against all odds. They were totally and emphatically outgunned and outmanned. This is more miraculous to me than the Six Day War. Maybe, maybe more miraculous than the Independence War of 48. I don't know. But they were called to assimilate. Do you follow? Understand what was going on. Satan wanted them to assimilate. They wanted them to lighten up. Stop taking God so seriously. Because Israel... For all intensive purposes in the Jewish people, if you want to go to the overall principle of why they were positioned where they were positioned, why God said to Abraham, you're coming with me, you're going to be the first Jew. Yeah, he was really the first Jew. Now, you might have a hard time with that because you go, he's from Mesopotamia, but there were no Jewish people. They were created people. They were called Yehudas, praises of God. Now, this is where it's going to get dicey because I'm telling you, there are so many people following this fakakta crazy Hebraic root stuff out there today, that they're going down a path that's very, very dangerous. Because what God did in, in our time is nothing short of the greatest thing that he's, that he's done, and that was to raise up the Messianic movement to be a bridge between the lost sheep of the house of Israel and the church of Jesus Christ. He raised it up, so what does Satan do? He can't stop it. He thought he could stop it. Many people, many church leaders said, it's a fad and it's going to go away. Well, it didn't go away, and it's not going away, and it's, it's spreading like wildfire throughout the whole world. So because Satan couldn't put it away, what he did was he wants to make it dysfunctional. So he wants to make denominations within Messianic Judaism, just like he did in Christianity, and he's doing a wonderful job today, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you to be careful of the internet be careful of what you're reading from people who have no legitimacy and no scholarship. Any knucklehead could get on the internet and put information, and you're a bigger knucklehead for following it. Try following the Bible. Try that. They were called to assimilate, but a remnant, and there always is a remnant. There's a remnant today. It is not church membership. There is a remnant of the true believer. I'm not saying you are, you're not. I'm not saying I am or I'm not. I'm telling you a fact. There is a remnant. There always was a remnant, and there always will be a remnant, a group who decide to remain consecrated. They decide to remain set apart no matter what. And because of their Hanukkah, because of their dedication, God blessed it and performed the miraculous, and in his name they had victory. And there is no different today. You are being called to assimilate. And many are falling apart saying, well, we do this for the kids. So the kids come before God. Already you have an idol. Rabbi, that's mean. That is the Bible, my friends. I'm not being mean. I'm not being nice. I'm not being pessimistic. I'm not being optimistic. I'm a teacher of the word of God. Whether I follow it or not is not an issue. I'm giving you the word of God. That's the issue. And Yeshua said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword to divide mother against daughter. And when they said to Yeshua, your mother and your brothers are outside, he said, who are my mother and my brothers but those who do the will of my father? It sounds strong, but this is true Christianity. This is true faith. This is true. You can't add to it, and you can't take away. And this holy day, this holiday, is amazing how it brings this message home. This is the most important message I think you can hear. 
the message of Hanukkah. In most Jewish circles today, Hanukkah is more cultural with the focus on the miracle of the oil, celebrating with lighting the Hanukkah. The Hanukkah is the nine-branch candlestick. The menorah is the seven-branch candlestick that you see here. But the Hanukkah is nine-branch. Lighting of the Hanukkah, kia, playing dreidel, eating lachis, and giving gifts. By the way, giving gifts is a modern Jewish tradition, obviously developed in the response to the older tradition of giving gifts on Christmas. And, and just so you know, you wonder why we're in debt? The National Retail Federation reports that 90% of Americans celebrate Christmas. Now, I used to celebrate Christmas. Do you really think, I mean, forgive me for badgering the witness, but do you think that 90% of America are part of the remnant of Jesus Christ? Guys, are you out of your mind to even think that it's half? 90% of people celebrate Christmas with trees and parties and getting wasted. And and what do you do when your kid asks you, if your kid says you, hey, Daddy, what's that? It's a tree. Well, what does it mean? It represents Jesus. How? I don't know. <laughs> Ask your grandmother. And so what we're doing, so listen, guys, I'm going to teach this in two parts. Next week, Dwayne's going to be here. I have to go to a conference. We're part of the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America. I have to go to one conference a year to maintain that. I believe in coverings, so I believe in, in being responsible and submitting to a covering. I'm not a lone ranger, so we have a covering, and the covering is exceptional. Are they perfect? No, but it's the best we got out there in the Messianic community, if you ask me, because they're stable. And they get, the, they get good theology, and they get good charismata, and they're not out. I got a call from a publisher. I'm not going to tell you who, but a major publisher that is asking me to write a book, and they're going to pay for everything. I don't have the time to do it, but this is what they said. We watch Hebraic Roots teachers all the time, and all of them are angry. We love the Hebraic Roots, but they're angry. They just attack the church. And I said, I know. They're a bunch of nutty Gentiles. <laughs> Jews don't attack the church. Jews are happy they're saved. We don't want to attack the church. What are you accomplishing by attacking the church and attacking your family and attacking your grandmother? If this is what you, if you've gotten this revelation and you've embraced it like Cornelius and you come to me and you say, Rabbi Greg, I am not Jewish, but I want to live a messianic lifestyle. I go, brother, welcome home. Come on. You're my brother. You understand? But I will not tell you to go back and beat up your family. What, what do you gain from that? You think they're not saved? You really think they're not saved for putting up a tree? Then you're not saved every time you sin. It's don't, don't do that. I don't want you to do that because what you're doing, sadly enough, is you're giving the Messianic movement a bad name, you're giving Beth Yeshua International a bad name, and you're giving me a bad name. That's not my style. If you've received, yeah, they think this is what you've been taught. I don't teach that. I don't teach that. Salvation is salvation. If you want to live a messianic lifestyle, I need to live a messianic lifestyle. Because I have to be a testimony, according to the Bible, that God is good. That he hasn't forgotten the Jewish people. And if he doesn't break the Abrahamic covenant, then he won't break the new covenant. But if he breaks the Abrahamic covenant, he could break the new covenant. And then Christians don't have a leg to stand on. So I help them. I help encourage them just by living this lifestyle and saying, yes, I believe in Yeshua. And the Jewish community says to me all the time, look, Rabbi, if you would just give up the Jesus thing, then we don't have a problem with you calling yourself a Jew. Buddy, I'm a Jew. You can't take it away from me. Nobody can. Nobody will. No more than they could take the fact that Jesus is a Jew. He's coming back the king of the Jews. It's not was. Can't take it away. The church says to me, well, we like you because you believe in Jesus, but if you would just leave the Jewish stuff behind. Well, that's why I like you because you believe in Jesus. You accept me for that, that's why I accept you. But why are you so crazed about me worshiping on a day that is biblical versus a day that is man-made? I think you could worship on any day, but why do you have such a hard time with me still honoring the day that was never taken away? Knock yourself out, but why are you so angry? And I'm worshiping God's feast days, and you're worshiping man-made days, which, by the way, Yeshua hated, but I'm not mad at you for it. Knock yourself out. But why are you so angry that I'm doing the feast days? Why does that make you so angry? Is there a conviction? What, what, what am I doing that's making you so angry? I'm not telling you you have to. What are you so angry about? But you, what do you accomplish by attacking them?
doesn't make any sense, guys, and please stop it. Just stop it. Because I meet people sometimes in the mall, and they'll go, oh, you're Rabbi Greg. <laughs> and we're out there. Yesterday, I needed to go over the scriptures, so I needed to find a quiet place. So I wanted to go somewhere to eat where I didn't think anybody would be. So I went to this little place downtown called Tokyo Alley. There's like six tables in it. And I went early. I went like at 11.30, knowing that I'd be the only one there. And I walk in, there's a table of just 12 ladies, probably a good octogenarians. And I walk in, and I, I don't recognize any of them. They're like, all of them, hello, Rabbi Greg. <laughs> and I went, they've all been to the synagogue. You know, everybody's been once or twice. Everybody. You know, this is Macon, Georgia. You, you know what? Like telephone, telegraph, teleperson in Macon. <laughs> what I'm saying is you, got, you stick out when you're a New York or former Orthodox Jew who loves Yeshua. You stick out in Macon. And some people absolutely love me and some people can't stand me. Some people will run to me at a store and some people will run away. And this is just the way it is because of, but I think they're misunderstood of why I do what I do and who I am. I'm a Messianic Jew. And I'm called to live a certain lifestyle. And I think there are Gentiles now that see that a lot of these things that they've been doing aren't necessarily of God. They're man-made. And they want to live a Messianic lifestyle because they feel like it was more of a lifestyle of Yeshua. And I, I embrace that. That's a Cornelius move. That's a first century move. I embrace that. But let me tell you something, kiddo. If you think that God's going to give you brownie points because you're celebrating Rosh Hashanah, but you ain't giving a dime to the poor little woman the orphan, you're sorely, you're sorely mistaken. Sorely mistaken. Because it says Yeshua is coming back in the glory of his Father and his recompense is with him. And if you think he's going to give out rewards because you blew the shofar, on Yom Teruah, you're crazy if that's all you're doing. In most Christian circles, Hanukkah bears basically little or no significance. At best, some see it as Jewish Christmas. Have you heard that? Yeah. Where, where did they get that from? Who, who told them that it's Jewish Christmas? What does that even mean, Jewish Christmas? If the Jews don't believe in Yeshua's birth, that's like an oxymoron. How could, who's saying that? Does anybody know what they're saying? I think somehow maybe because it falls on the 25th day of Kislev, which is in December, I think that's where the miscommunication is, like 25th day, you know? And it's so sad for some of the cultural Jews, I don't know if you remember, in the 70s in New York, some of the, some of the kids felt slighted, you know? Because we got to give gifts for eight nights, so we give like a pencil, you know, without an eraser, a pre-chewed pencil. Here, you know, a locker falls on the floor. Here, here's a dirty locker. You know, we can't give eight great gifts. And then on Christmas in my neighborhood, you know, the kids got like motorcycles for Christmas. It's like, and I'm playing with a broken pencil without an eraser. So we, we developed the Hanukkah bush. And then we developed Hanukkah Harry. You see how the influences of man-made traditions in fact, something like Hanukkah that is such a phenomenal, powerful, miraculous, divine holy day? And listen to me, guys. I'm telling you something so you hear this because I don't know how long I'll be around until it could be the last day. You are being called to assimilate every day the devil and his demons, and there are many demons out there, and they're still out there. You, you check Genesis. The Nephilim were there. And afterwards, it says, after the flood, they're around and they're constantly coming after you to assimilate. And they're constantly saying to you, take it easy. Lighten up. God just wants you to be happy. Yeah, God just wants you to be happy. Explain 1.5 million children 10 years old and younger who were murdered in the Holocaust. Explain, reconcile that one for me. Set the bar high. If you want to be a believer, set the bar high. I'm not saying that there's not grace, guys. There's tons of grace, but set the bar high and go for it. And be careful, because in these last days, the enemy is going to try to get you to assimilate. 
He's going to try to get you to light, lighten up. Don't take God so seriously. If you don't take God seriously and you are not serious about your faith and your faith is not developed now, how do you think you're going to fare up when the crap really hits the fan? It's nothing right now. And everybody has problems. Everybody I talk to, emotional problems and financial problems and marital problems and, 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 and physical problems and spiritual problems. And there's so many problems people have now. And, it, and these are barely the birth pangs. The water hasn't even broke yet. Okay, Hanukkah is obviously not in the Old Testament, right? Does, any, does anybody have it in there? It, did I miss it? I'm sorry. It's, it's not in there. It's not, I said the Old Testament, sir. It's okay. It's not in the Old Testament, right? But let me give you a few books that Hanukkah is referenced so you don't think somebody wrote it, you know, a couple of years ago, okay? I don't want you to think that when I reference certain things about Hanukkah, it's coming out of the air, all right? It's not, it's not revelatory. It's been written. Hang in there, lady. You'll be all right. Let's look, okay? Webster's Dictionary, Hanukkah is referenced. The Encyclopedia Britannica, Hanukkah is referenced. This is not an exhaustive lo- list. Of course, the Encyclopedia Judaica, the Jewish encyclopedia. Josephus, the most well-regarded historian that's ever lived, ever will live, in his book, War of the Jews, by the way, you can read that if you like. It's 75, it was written in 75 AD. It's the most famous work. He's also a hagiographer, which is the critical st- study of the lives of saints. He is his first century Roman Jewish historian. Amazing. The Septuagint, anybody know that? It means 70, 70 scholars were locked in a room and wrote about this book. It's Latin for 70. It's the oldest Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Okay, it's the oldest. It started translating from the Hebrew Bible in 283 BC and it was completed in 132. That's why it was included because the story took place in 167. So it was completed by 132 BC and that's why. So it's in there. It's in the Septuagint, which again is the oldest Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Okay, the Gomorrah, which is the portion of the Talmud written in 500 AD in Tractate Shabbat 21. You can read all about Hanukkah. The Megillot Antiochus, which is the Aramaic and Hebrew scrolls of second century Jewish writings. Then you have many historical books, and there's thousands. I just listed three. These are very well known. Rome and the Mediterranean to 133 BC, of course, was included. A.E. Austin, F.W. Wallbank, M.W. Fredrickson. The history of the ancient world from the earliest accounts of the fall of Rome, Susan Louise Bauer, and the Oxford history of Greece and the Hellenistic world, John Boardman. Okay, many, many, many books the story is written about, and what's interesting is they all agree. Okay? First and second Maccabees. Now, people have a problem with the Apocrypha because they think it means legendary. It means nothing but hidden away. I don't have a problem with the Apocrypha because what the Apocrypha does, it does not contradict any teaching in our Bible. And interestingly enough, in the King James Bible, it was in there till 1885. Why wasn't the Apocrypha included in the Old Testament? Some rabbis decided that they were going to exclude all works post-Ezra, which is 5th century B.C. How did they decide that? I don't know. Was it inspirational? Was it revelatory? I don't know. But I do know that I've read 1st and 2nd Maccabees, and I do know that it agrees with all the history books, the Septuagint and everything else, and I do know it doesn't contradict. I'll give you an example. It, it, it fosters... The teaching that there's an afterlife, it teaches about spiritual fruits of martyrdom, as well as the resurrection of the dead. And if you want to look, 2 Maccabees 6.26 will teach you all about that. And at last, but definitely not least, it's spoken in the New Testament. Now, most people would not know this. I think if you've been here, you've been in messianic circles, of course you know this. But most people, if you ask them, if you ask the average Christian kid, where's where's Hanukkah spoken about? They would definitely guess the Old Testament, right? But nothing was canonized after Ezra, after 5th century B.C., so it can't be there because it happened afterwards. But it's mentioned in the New Testament. Now look, John 10, 22, 23. Let me show you in the um, KJV and the NASV. It says, and it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication. Now you've probably read this many times because John 10 is very compelling. It's all about Yeshua claiming to be the Messiah, claiming Messiahship. He says he's the gate. He says, my sheep hear my voice. It's very compelling. He also says the Father and I are one, and it was at Jerusalem during the Feast of Dedication. So you, as being brought up in the church, you read this a thousand times. You just didn't know dedication was English for Hanukkah. 
But what I'm, at, what I'm just thinking is, and, and I know now you do this, but when you were reading this, didn't you wonder what the feast was? Or did you think God just mentioned it for no reason? Do you realize how small your Bible is? Look at some of the Eastern religions. Look at the Bhagavad Vedas. Look at the I Ching. Thousands. Even, even the Talmud, the oral law. It's codified 6,200 pages. Do you realize how small? I know most people think Bible is big, especially today, you know, where we could barely get through a long text. But the Bible is very small. Guys, it's very small. And the words of Yeshua are the most important words. And that's really small. There's like 1,400 sentences. And if you look at the, the, the synoptic gospels, then there's really only about 800 sentences. Do you realize how small that is? We say we're a follower of Yeshua and his teachings, and that's all we have to know, 800 sentences. It's very tiny, so I would think if God wrote this, he wrote this for a reason. And when you read something, don't just gloss over it. If you were in a church and somebody read, and it was the feast dedication, wouldn't you go, oh, what was, well, why did they mention that? Why did they mention that Yeshua was in Jerusalem for the feast of dedication? It must have some significance, right? Now, just because we don't know the significance, that shouldn't stop us from asking. Because obviously, if God wrote it, or God, was, God told John to write it, it has to be something significant. In the NASV, again, it was the Feast of Dedication at Jerusalem. But now, if you go to the NLT, of course, the CJB. Let's go to that for a sec. Of course, it says, then came Hanukkah, because it's the complete Jewish Bible. And that's why I choose to read it. Do I, do I think that David Stern is perfect? By no means. By no means. Would there be a couple of things I would change? Yeah. I'm sure if I did the Greg Hirschberg version, there would be a couple of things I would change. But I prefer that over all of them because at least it has some kind of cultural substance. Because the Bible is written by Jews to Jews in a Jewish place. The NLT, though, because it's the New Living Translation, it's not a paraphrase. It is a translation with excellent Hebrew and Greek scholarship. Okay, at least they got it though. Can you imagine? They knew to put Hanukkah, the festival of dedication. Good for them. I'm proud of them. Now, we'll look into that, and I'll I'll share with you why I think I don't know about today, but I will share with you on the 26th why I think Yeshua was there, why I think this festival was incredibly important to him, and why then. Uh, if the premise is that the festival was very important to him and he's very important to you, I would think what's important to him would be important to you. Is that, is that fair? Is that logic? It's logical. Now, although Hanukkah isn't mentioned overtly in the Old Testament, it's definitely prophesied, right? I'm going to share just a few scriptures with you from the book of Daniel. I can, we can talk about Daniel till Yeshua returns. So it's not going to be exhaustive. I can't spoon feed you. I can give you things to to prompt you to want to study on your own. You have a good concordance. You have a good Bible. You have a good mind. And you have a good Holy Spirit. You can be a theologian. Okay? I can just spur you on and encourage you. But this is what you can do on your own. The thing about Daniel, it's so prophetically accurate. It's so forthtelling. He's so much of a prognosticator that there are many antagonists that go, no way could that have been written in the 6th century B.C. Too accurate. Who could, who could do that? A prophet could do that. If there's a God, right? If there's a God, then they could be at, but most people can't handle the book of Daniel. Let's, um, let's look at Daniel 8. Hanukkah's historicity is definitely prophesied here. Daniel gets the vision of the ram and the goat nations which is Persia and Greece, respectively, okay? You can read many history books. Guys, there's so much history, external references, extra-biblical teachings about the history of Greece and midi Persia and on and on the Assyrians. There's tons of books on the subject. I don't have the time to read it, to be perfectly frank with you, but I definitely could read the Bible. It says, after that vision, it was the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. What's neat is you'll see this king. You'll see the dates line up with history books. That another vision appeared to me. Don't you realize if these dates didn't line up, how many Christian antagonists would attack this? The best they could do is, ah, he didn't write it when you say. It's the best they could do. 
I looked up, and as I watched, there in front of the steam stood a ram with two horns. Now, you're going to read a lot about horns in this section, okay? Horns always represent, in the Bible, military power or prowess. When you're looking for something, the Bible isn't all literal. If you take it literal, then, then God's a chicken because you can't stand under his wings. So you can't take it literal, okay? There's much in the Bible that's symbolic and figurative. What you have to do with figurative language is see a common thread. You can't just decide, okay, that's what it means. You've got to see this all throughout the Bible and go, okay, if it means that all throughout the Bible, then that's what it means. Whenever you see horns, symbolic of power and prowess, okay? I looked up and there in front of me stood a ram with two horns, okay? The horns were long, but one was longer than the other. So you have a long horn and a short horn because the ram represents Persia. Okay, and the long horn was the king of Persia, stronger. The short horn was the king of Midia, two different areas of this empire. The horns were long, one was longer than the other, and the longer one came up later. The longer one came up later, Persia came up after Midia. I saw the ram pushing to the west. I saw the ram pushing to the west, west of Babylon, and Persia is Greece. North and south, and no animals could stand up against it, nor was there anyone that could rescue from its power. Very, very, very powerful empire. So it did as it pleased and it became very strong, spread itself all over. I was beginning to understand when a male goat, the male goat is Greece. It came from the west, Greece, the west, west of Babylon and Persia is Greece, passing over the whole earth without touching the ground. Powerful, pow it just, Alexander the Great, powerful. The goat had a prominent horn between its eyes. That was Alexander the Great. He ruled 334 to 331. This is just history. And it lines up beautifully with the Bible. Isn't that great? It's not, it's not a goofy book. It's not a goofy book. There is so much bibliography. You know how you have 6,000 codexes, manuscripts, of, of the New Testament alone? Some written within 20 years of its event. There's nothing like it. 24,000 manuscripts, if you count the Latin Vulgate. Do you know you have the Leningrad Codex, you know the Aleppo Codex from the 10th century AD, full Old Testament copies, Dead Sea Scrolls from 250 B.C. that line up exactly with what we read today with the Bible off the shelf at Walmart. <sighs> unbelievable, guys. Just unbelievable. Let's continue. It says, it approached the ram with two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the river. Alexander the Great approached Belteshazzar, charged it with savage force. I watched it advance on the ram, filled with rage against it, and it struck the ram, breaking its two horns. It destroyed the kingdom. The ram was powerless to stand against it. It threw the ram to the ground, trampled it down, and there was no one that could rescue from its power, of the goat's power. Done. Greece took over. Okay? Let's continue. The male goat then became extremely strong, but when it was strong, the big horn was broken. Who's the big horn? Alexander the Great. He died a mysterious death, 323 B.C., his kingdom was 1.5 million square miles. Unbelievable. But when it was strong, the big horn was broken. In its place arose what happened to be four horns. History will, any history book will tell you he had four generals. And any history will, book will tell you those four generals took over in four different regions, okay? The regions were Egypt, Syria, Babylon, Asia Minor, Turkey, and Greece. He had four specific regions, and when he died, his four generals took over each region. Out of them came a little horn, which grew extremely big in all directions of the south and the east and the direction of the glory. That was Antiochus Epiphanes. He ruled from 175 B.C. to 164. I know it's a lot. I don't expect you to take it all in. I'm just trying to show you in a very short amount of time how accurate the Word of God is. It grew so great that it reached the army of heaven. The army of heaven was the persecution of the, and the murder of the Jews. It hurled many of the stars down to the ground and trampled on them. The direction of the glory is obviously Israel and Jerusalem, the glorious land. There was so, they, it, he even says, yes, he even considered himself great as the prince of the army. He considered himself as great as the prince of the army. He, to, he took the prince, who was the high priest, Onias III in 170 B.C., and murdered him. And then it says that he took away the regular burnt offering, which was the morning and the evening sacrifice, called the eternal sacrifice. It's there every day. Every day during the temple was standing, was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. The temple was desecrated, and this is what he ordered. This is what Antiochus. See, Israel, if I could just, if I could just, you know, kind of kind of go off on a on a little thought here. Israel was placed at the crossroads of the world. 
There was no America. And why do you think God put Israel, positioned it right there? Why do you think he took Abraham and said, you're going to be the first praiser of God. You're going to give birth to the son of promise. He's going to give birth to a man who's going to birth the tribes. And from those tribes, kings are going to come, even the king of all kings. And there'll always be somebody sitting on the throne, the Davidic covenant. And then he said, I'm going to take you away from your family and put you in Israel. Everybody had to pass through those crossroads. The big wars were the Ptolemaic and the Seleucid kingdoms, Syria and Egypt. They always had to go through Israel. And some people were intrigued. The, the, the people of Greece were very intelligent. They were very philosophical. And they were intrigued. Wow, one God? One God? Just one God? One wife? One wife? You guys are, are told to be honest? Not steal? No adultery? No. This is a, they were, some were intrigued. Some were angry like in Antiochus. Because what Israel was doing is convicting people without even saying a word. Isn't it beautiful if what you carry could convict people without even opening up your mouth? If you were really worshiping God right, you wouldn't have to tell grandma about the Christmas tree. She'll see it in your walk. So look what Antiochus takes away. He's angry, and we'll get into that. But he takes away... All the things that are near and dear to Jewish people. No reading Torah, no worshiping on the feast, which Shabbat is included, and you've got to eat pork. Do you know I have an honest-to-goodness friend? He's a Messianic rabbi. He's about 80 years old. His father was a farmer in North Carolina. His father was a Messianic Jew before there was a resurrected Messianic Jewish movement. On his deathbed, pastors came to him, honest-to-goodness story, and said, we're so worried about your salvation because you still hold on to the rights of Judaism. They made the man eat pork on his deathbed because they convinced him was that there was the only way he'd see Jesus. And in his tears, he said, if this is the only way I'll see my Lord and Savior, then so be it. What a mess. What a mess. How sad. Let's continue with this for a minute. The first said to me, 2,300 evenings. It's interesting. 2,300 evenings. It went exactly from 170 to December 14th, 164. Exactly 2,300 evenings. It's crazy, guys. I'm telling you, this is, you can't make this stuff up. This is crazy. And it will be restored to a rightful state. That's when Judah Maccabee cleansed the temple, December 14th, 164. Let's go on to Daniel 11. We're almost done with this. There will arise in his place a despicable man, not entitled to inherit the majesty of the kingdom but he will come without warning and gain the kingdom by intrigue this was antiochus the fourth he conspired against ptolemy the seventh who was the head of the egyptian kingdom with ptolemy the sixth he conspired with his brother total intrigue total total deceit all about deceit he will summon his power and courage against the king of the south with the great army that's Ptolemy VII, the king of the south, is Egypt, and the king of the south will fight back with a very large and powerful army, but he will not succeed because of the plots devised against him, because he was, Antiochus was in bed with his brother. These two kings, the two kings that I mentioned before, Antiochus IV and King Ptolemy VI, were bent on mischief, will sit at the same table, speaking lies to each other. They're, they're in cahoots, but they're looking to take over the kingdom themselves. Couldn't trust anybody. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the people of God really were honest all the time? But none of this will succeed because the appointed end will, come, will not have come yet. Then the king of the north will return to his own land with great wealth. So the king of the north, if he's returning Antiochus from Egypt, what does he have to go through? And he does not like the Jewish people. See, a lot of the Greeks had no problem with them. They were like, look, you serve a God? Cool. It's another God. You follow? As long as you don't cause any insurrection, as long as you don't persecute our people in any way, as long as you pay your taxes, worship any gods you want. If you go to India, you'll see pictures of Jesus Christ all over the place. He's one of the 1.2 million gods. You follow? But this guy had a problem. He had a real problem with the Jewish people. And it says, with his heart set against the holy covenant. Do you know Hitler was persecuting the Jewish people because he hated the God of the Jewish people? And he thought if he could destroy the Jews, he could destroy the Torah. If he destroys the Torah, he destroys God. That's what he was really after. Because he couldn't deal with his guilt. So he wanted to get rid of God. If I can get rid of God, I can get rid of my guilt. 
And that's exactly what Antioch is. It's the spirit of the Antichrist. The Antichrist isn't instead of Christ. It's against. It's a, it's a spirit, you follow? It's a spirit to hate the commandments of God. Baruch HaTor Adonai, Eloheinu Melch When we speak this, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us by our commandments. Now, a lot of Christians have a problem with that Jewish prayer. What do you mean sanctified by our commandments? What do you mean, what do I mean? John 17, 17, the very last words of Yeshua, right before he's being taken in John 18 when he's killed, he says, sanctify them by thy truth. Your word is truth. He said the same thing, guys. He didn't change anything. Yes, he gave us the laws on our hearts, and now we're more obligated those Jews had to go to Moses. Now we don't have to go to nobody. They're on the inside. So he starts heading back to Syria. And he goes towards Jews in Jerusalem. He sees them worshiping the way they are. And he feels it's insurrection. So he just starts massacring. And in three days, he went after mostly women, the aged, children, virgins and infants in three days he killed eighty thousand people now you you're talking about second century bc all they had was sharp weapons do you understand what was going on how that army was just massacring people left and right eighty thousand people that's almost thirty thousand a day if they were doing that for a whole day, do you realize how many people that was? An hour, how many people that was a minute? I mean, so, so evil. Look, there's always been crazy people in the world, like a Jeffrey Dahmer and a David Berkowitz and a Ted Bundy. This isn't crazy. This is totally, totally satanically infiltrated. You understand? You've got to call it for what it is. Two women were arrested, for instance, because they had their baby circumcised. You could not circumcise your baby... You could not eat kashrut, and you could not read the Torah. What makes a person distinctly Jewish? They read and obey Torah, they circumcise their children, and if they eat kashrut, that's how you know. If I go somewhere and I say, oh, the beans, you know, if I'm in Memphis, the beans, are there pork and the beans? The guy automatically would go, are you Jewish? He knows I'm not Muslim because I'm not wearing a head covering. You must be Jewish. They know. Secular people know. That's how I remain distinct. How else... Do you realize, I'm not knocking it. Look, I tell you, I don't attack the church. I don't know why you do. I don't know why you do. I don't know what you're so angry about. You had the same Bible. It's your fault. Why do you keep, why do you keep blaming everybody for your own fault? You're doing the same thing that, that Adam did. Hey, it's her. And then Eve says, it's this. you're doing the same thing. You laugh, but you're doing the same thing. Don't you see what you're doing? It's not, it's not right. But I'm, for instance, if I just... If I just joined the church, my kids would not know anything about their Judaism, you follow? And then their kids would not even know that their grandfather was Jewish, it'd be gone. How could they be, they're not walking in their destiny. And it's not destiny according to me, it's biblical prophecy. They have to walk in their heritage to show that they're Jews who believe in Yeshua because they're the remnant. They're the remnant of Israel, not the Orthodox community. They're the remnant. They're the true remnant, the Jews who know that Messiah has come and will come again and rule and reign forever as the son of David. They're the remnant. And I just think that for the Gentile world, they're, just, they're getting a revelation that, man, I'm grafted into the olive tree. I'm grafted into the olive tree. And what is the olive tree? The seed of the olive tree is Abraham. The roots are Isaac. The trunk is Jacob. The branches are the 12 tribes. So if you're grafted in, don't you take on that position? As a wild olive shoot, don't you take that on? So if you take that on, be happy with that's the revelation you got and walk in that revelation. Amen. What do you care if nobody else is doing it? Daniel was alone in Babylon. He didn't care if anybody was doing it or not. He said, king, no offense, but this is what I have to do. I can't bow down to any other god. Just be happy about it. What I have a problem with is some of your families saying things like, what do you think, you're a Jew? That's very anti-Semitic, and I don't appreciate it. Let them know that. And it shows a total lack of love and mercy, and it shows an antichrist spirit to me. Because yeah. if they think Jesus would ever pull that on you, they're crazy. 
All right, let's look at another verse in Daniel 11.32. It says, those who, this is very powerful, guys. I'll, I'll, I'll get you out of here in a short time. Those who act wickedly against the covenant, he will corrupt with his blandishments. Antiochus, he's, he's, an anti, he's, an, he's not the Antichrist, but he is housed with the spirit of Antichrist. There's many of them, okay? Many of them. The, the Antichrist will come soon. Those who act wickedly against the covenant. So who, if this is B.C., who is he talking to? Gentiles? No, it can't be Gentiles. They had nothing to do with the covenant. That was Ephesians, right? You who are far off from the covenant and now brought in. That didn't happen yet, right? So he's talking to Jewish people. People that were supposed to be in line with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and people that were supposed to be following the covenant. Abrahamic, Mosaic, Israeli, those covenants of God, those covenants. God made a pact with Israel, right? He said, hey, I'll be your God. I'll take care of you. I'll be your provider. I'll be there for you. You just got to obey me, right? Remember Exodus 19? Remember Moses came down to the mountain and said, hey, God's going to give us his ways. They're like, cool. He's going to be your God as long as you obey. Say, nothing's changed. He will corrupt. So the Antichrist corrupts with blandishments, but the people who know, that is so important, that word know. Gnose in the Greek, yada in the Hebrew, it's used in the Hebrew Bible 872 times. What does Yeshua say when he goes, go from me? You never, all throughout the Gospels. You knew of me. You knew about me, you did things in my name, but you did not really know who I was, did you? We did not have intimate fellowship, did we? It's spiritual intercourse. It's being so close with the Lord that you know his heart. You know what makes him tick. Of course, he knows us. Talking about intimate communion, intimate fellowship. Those who know, those Jews who know their God, they'll stand firm. And not only will they stand firm, they'll win. This is, this is a very powerful text in this book of Daniel. Very powerful. Let's look at the word blandishment for a minute. Chalacha. Isn't it neat how it looks very close to Chanukah? Do you see how the devil twists? Blandishment. Smooth talk. Be careful of smooth talk. Listen, I'm just telling you. If you need something, just tell me. Don't, don't try to blow smoke up my dress because I smell it a mile away. Don't give me compliments and stuff, then go, well, well, I was thinking, Rabbi, we could do in Shabbat school. You're enticing. You're intriguing. You're using blandishments. I don't appreciate it. It's manipulative. I don't like it. Just be honest. Smooth talk, sweet words, enticements. And why do, why do you use blandishments, smooth talk, sweet words? To beguile and to deceive. Okay? Dedication, the word is Chanukah, to be set apart. Set apart. And if you look at the root word, which is crucial, it's chanak, to train. And isn't that what Yeshua came to do? To train us in his ways. And then he sent his 12 out and he said, what do you say? Go into all the world and do the same thing. Now, one smooth talk didn't work because that's what he tried. He goes, look, guys, come on, just stop this nonsense because we don't want any bloodshed, you know? And I'll take care of you guys. I'll help you out. I'll drop you tax stuff. One smooth talk doesn't work. What happens? You know what happens. People get ugly. Right? Oh, okay, we're going to go there. I tried to be nice to you. Okay, let's go. Come on, you all do it. You're on the phone all nice, and then like, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Oh, you can't. All right. So he, res he, he res resorted to terror tactics, the same thing that you see today. Terrorism has not changed. He was terrorist. He commanded his subjects to worship pagan gods, to bow down to idols, and eat swine. He thought if he could control the temple, he could sever Judaism at its source. It was the temple. That's where it all went down. So in 167 BC, a Seleucid troop commanded by this guy, Apelles, this is just history, went to Modin. You familiar with Modin? It's 17 miles northwest of Jerusalem. And Modin had a priest. Every town had a priest. And who was that priest? Mattiahu or Mattathias, if you're going for the Greek version. Mattiahu was his name. He was Hebrew. He was Jewish. The Seleucid army consisted of 100 foot soldiers and 20, 100,000, forgive me, and 20,000 cavalry. All expertly trained. They took over the whole kingdom from Midian and Persia. You understand? This was a well-oiled army, trained incredibly well. How in the world 
are a couple of Jews without weapons going to defeat them. The Jewish people were outgunned, and I don't mean a little. It was ridiculous. But God, in essence, in essence, what I'm here to tell you guys is that Hanukkah was a war between Judaism and paganism. You hear what I'm I'm telling you? Jews don't know that. Christians don't know that. I don't think it's, it's, it's this incredible revelation. It's not like I sat on a mountain. But Jews were being asked to assimilate, and you're being asked to assimilate, Mrs. Christian. You're being asked to be tolerant and relative and apathetic and politically correct. They want you to shut down and shut up. Now, you don't have to be mean, and you don't have to get everybody to believe like you do, but can you be a Christian? If you were arrested for being a Christian, would they have enough evidence to convict you? Or is it just talk and wearing T-shirts and, a, and a, a fish on the back of the car? Because we're all going to be tested in these last days. I'm not saying how I'm going to fare up because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I fare up or not, does it? My faring up is not going to help you. Mm-mm. You're going to have to fare up for yourself. I'm not saying you have to be selfish, but you have to decide. And today's a good day to decide to be dedicated. It was, it was as much of a civil war as it was a war against the Greeks. It was a war within Judaism. Because every now and then in society, a progressive, sophisticated culture comes along and says, hey, hey, let me entice you. I mean, look at you guys. Look at what you're wearing. And you keep going to the temple and just praying to this God. Do you see? You know what he did? He built a gymnasium. He built an entertainment center, an entertainment complex. Antiochus. That's how he tried to win him over. And he said, right next to the temple. Can you imagine? And he goes, look how boring this is. Don't you want to go out and have some fun? Yeah, get drunk and have fun. You still love God. You're still saved. Just, you know, be like the world. Nobody will know you. And this way the world will like you. And isn't it important to be well-liked? Don't you want to be well-liked? Aren't you dying to be well-liked? Remember what the angel said to Daniel? As soon as you started praying, we perked up in heaven. And God God dispensed me, Gabriel, the messenger angel. He dispensed me because we know you. We know you up in heaven, Daniel. And he was a humble man. He wasn't arrogant, and he wasn't beating nobody up. He just was set apart. He was set apart. In Daniel 1, it says, I decided a little boy, a little teenage boy, away from his family, away from the temple, away from everything he held near and dear. He said, I can't eat that food. And he decided to be resolute. I'm resolute, Psalm 57. I'm resolute, O Lord. He made that decision. It was his choice. He, he, he decided to be committed, and he was aware of that commitment, and he chose. He chose to be resolute. He just did. And this world keeps encroaching, and they keep encroaching, and they keep telling you to lighten up. Lighten up. You're weird. You're narrow. You're narrow. You're not, you're not, you've got to widen up. And Yeshua said, the road that's wide... And the world says, how do you know your Bible? How do you, and we don't read, we don't study, not the Bible. You could study the Bible. You could know every verse and still not have any authenticity that it's legitimate. You could memorize every verse in the Bible and still not be able to defend it. It's not about memorizing the Bible. It's how, how do we know it's a legitimate, authentic, literary document? How do we know? You read the, journal, the New England Journal of Medicine and you find these findings. You go, this is legitimate because they have statistics, they have bibliography. They, how do you know? Wouldn't it be nice to have a little idea so that every time something goes wrong, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe my faith isn't legit. Maybe I'm imagining this. Maybe Yeshua's really not coming back. Maybe the enemy's beguiling you. And a side note, thank you, Lord. If you think that I walk this out all the time, you're crazy. But if you think that I don't try to, you're just as crazy. This happened, this happened to the, to the Jews in Spain. What do you think the Spanish Inquisition was about? Modernism, and get with the program, man. That Torah, that's old news. We got a new God. It's new. Just sing about his love. 
He just, you know, you're the only picture he has on his, on his refrigerator in heaven. He just loves you. You can't do no wrong. Accept that. Get with the new program. It happened in Spain in the Inquisition. It happened in Germany during the Holocaust. And it's happening today to Jews in America and in Israel. And if you think it's not happening to Christians, you're crazy. Somebody dragged me to a place one time. It was 20,000 seats, and I did not want to go because they wanted my opinion. I said, my opinion doesn't count. It doesn't matter. Discern it for yourself. They dragged me. They dragged me. They, for a year, you got to go, you got to go. So finally, I couldn't, I couldn't deal with them. And I went, and I went, and there was movie chairs, and they were so comfortable, and the music was better than Broadway. And afterward, they said, what do you think? I said, it doesn't matter. Just get me home. I didn't want to go in the first place. This is where you go, you go. You're happy with it, you're happy with it. But all that was missing was the popcorn. You have to be willing to change. That's what they say. You've got to change with the times, Rabbi. You've got to change with the times. You're not, you're not uh, relative. You're not relative. You're clueless. You're clueless. And I say that the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we don't need a new and improved formula. So this is the question I have for you today before we leave. To be or Maccabee? <laughs> this is the question. We're going to end with this. A couple of verses from the book of Maccabees, and I showed you where it's an authentic document. If you don't like the Apocrypha, just close your ears, okay? First Maccabees 2, 17, 18. It says, the king's commission is then addressed Mattathias. So they came. Remember I told you the unit went to Modaim. Why do they want the priest to bow down? Strike the shepherd, the sheep scatter. You get the priest, you get the people. They're just following him. Back in that day, believe it or not, priests and rabbis were respected, highly respected, and what they said was as good as law. So whatever he said, they would do. So the king's commissioners then addressed Mattathias as follows. Mattiahu, you are a respected leader, a great man in this town. He's the teacher. He's the teacher. He's the rabbi. He's the priest. You have sons and brothers to support you. Be the first to step forward and conform. Conform. There it is. Conform. Right? It says, don't conform to the world in Romans 12. Be transformed. Be the first to step forward. Come on. Come on. Conform to the king's decree. Don't make it bad on you. We don't want any trouble. Just give in. Give in. It's easy, isn't it? Isn't it easy to say yes? It's hard to say no. You will suffer for being obedient. Yeshua learned, learned obedience from what he suffered, it says in Hebrews. You will suffer. There will be things that will entice you that will go ahead. Everybody's doing it. And you will have to suffer to say no. As all the nations have done, all the, it's, everybody's doing it. Mattiahu, just give in. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. That must mean it's right, right? Everybody's doing it. Rabbi, get with the program. You're lost. Wake up. And all the nations have done, and the leaders of Judah and the survivors in Jerusalem, you and your son shall be... So, so the, the leaders in Judah are doing it. The nations are doing it outside of Israel. You follow? The leaders in Jerusalem are doing it. He knows they're doing it. Other priests are bowing down. They're giving up. They're reversing the circumcision so they could wrestle in the gymnasium. It was naked wrestling. It was all debauchery and immorality. And so in order for them to wrestle, if they were circumcised, they were considered to be mutilated. Where God says just the opposite. So they had to reverse their circumcision in order to wrestle. They were bowing down. If I could just get this guy in Modi'in, we're good to go. You and your son shall be reckoned among the friends of the king. You'll be special. He'll invite you to dinner parties. You can hang out with him in his palace. He's got jacuzzis. He's got the best wine. Don't you want that? Look, some of you need to drink some new wine. You and your sons will be honored with gold. Look what they're giving them. They're buying them. They want them to sell their soul. Look at what they're going to get. They're going to get on his private jet. You, listen, this is not going to be easy. When Bernadette and I were first in ministry, I was making $100 a week. And that went on for a while. And I had to work in a gym from 5 in the morning till 8 o'clock at night, if people wanted me to train them at home for $20, I did it. Any 20 bucks was huge to me. Can you imagine? 
and I was working crazy hours and all this, and I met a guy who was very wealthy, a billionaire, I don't want to tell you who, and he offered me a job, and it was very enticing. You're talking about a guy who was flat broke. Back then, it was in 1995-ish, six-ish. Jeremy was already born, 94, so it was about six-ish, seven-ish. Anyway, 150 grand to start, a company called Alexis, and a home. The guy really liked me. And it was so enticing, but I just felt like if I had to be his assistant, I would probably have to compromise. And I wanted it, though. I thought, man, burn, you know, I'm riding a freaking motorcycle in the winter. I'm freezing. I mean, I used to have a great job, but it all fell apart when I met the Lord. Man, we could have a real house. You know, I won't have to tell you to put, don't let it go past 84 in the summer in Florida. 84, we had our thermostat on. And I'd say, just stand outside for an hour, and you'll see it's nice and cooler inside. You're staying in too much. It's not easy. It's a fight. It's a battle. It's a battle to not put other gods before your God. It's a fight. Now, if you're putting it on 84 and you're just a cheapskate because you have money. I had no money. I couldn't pay the bill. That's a different issue. That means money is your God. So he says, come on, I'm going to give you, you're going to be on the private jet. You're going to have money, gold and silver. We're going to hold you in the highest regard. We have tons of feasts. We have tons of gods. We have tons of feasts. You'll come. We'll give you the nice seats. We're talking about the best food. You watch the Food Channel? It's chicken. (laughs) Stop it. Fry it. You guys fry everything, don't you? You must love Hanukkah. Mmm reckon you and your sons will be honored with gold and silver now listen he comes to the hometown the family of the kohanim he comes to manipulate the priest with blandishments look at first maccabees 2 19 22 raising his voice this is so unbelievable this this might be a little convicting but this should inspire you guys this should be so inspirational not not has nothing to do with judaism it has to do with godism This is timeless, guys. Raising his voice, Mattathias retorted, even if every nation living in the king's dominion obeys him, each forsaking its ancestral religion to conform to the king's decrees, I, my sons, and my brothers will still follow the covenant of our ancestors. Remember Daniel's friends? We don't know what God's going to do, but nevertheless, Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah, not, don't call them by their pagan names, it's awful. May heaven preserve us, may heaven. He doesn't know. He realizes he might die. That's not the issue. May heaven preserve us from forsaking the Lord. He's asking God to give him strength to keep following Torah and its observances. As for the king's order, we will not follow them. We shall not swerve from our own religion, either to the right or to the left. Is that biblical? Yeah, yeah I'll prove it to you. Look at, look at Deuteronomy, the last book of the Torah. Therefore, you ought to be careful to do as I don't know your God has ordered you. You are not to deviate either to the right or the left. Again, at the end of Deuteronomy, he was listing the blessings and the curses for obedience, disobedience. I don't know, will make you the head and not the tail. You'll be only above, never below. If you listen to, observe, and obey the mitzvot, the commandments of Adonai your God, and not turn away from any of the words I am ordering you today, neither to the right nor to the left, to follow after other gods and serve them. So there's the right and the left again. Let's look at Proverbs 4, 26, 27. Level the path for your feet and let all your ways be properly prepared. Then deviate neither to the right or to the left. Keep your foot far from evil. Book of Wisdom. Joshua, the commander who took over for Moses. Only be strong and very bold in taking care to follow all the Torah which Moshe, my servant, ordered you to follow. Do not turn from it either to the right or to the left. Then you will succeed wherever you go. Hanukkah is, is all about dedication, but it's, it's very much in line with the words of Yeshua. Look at what he says in Matthew 28. This is the very end of the gospel. The Jewish gospel, Matthew, he says, Go and make people from all nations into Talmudin, into disciples, immersing them in the reality of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that's where we put a period. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Went to Nicaragua, immersed 10. Who's going to teach them about your ways, Yeshua, when I get on the plane and go back home? I'm showing the pictures, but who's going to? 
Who's going to do this, the, that part of the commandment? Teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Yeshua is saying, teach them to obey. Teach them to obey. Teach them to obey my commandments. Remember, I'll be with you always, yes, even to the end of the age. So he says, you've got to be disciplined. And then Yeshua says, you've got to be narrow. Matthew 7, going through the narrow gate. For the gate that leads to destruction is wide. Look at all the Jewish people that were going through that gate. And the road broad. And many travel it. They want you to get wide. Hey, open up. Get with the program. You know, you're so narrow. You're like a right-wing, miserable, conservative loser. But it is a narrow gate and a hard road. It's hard, guys. It's hard. I'm not telling you it's easy. I'm telling you that after 25 years of doing this and not doing this, doing this, not this, this is easy. This is not a hard road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Remnant. Only a few will find it. And he said, you got to die. Look. Matthew 16, 24, 25. And by the way, this scripture is out of the gate. This is Christianity 101. This is like before he even died. This is like he's telling them this is what it's going to take. Yeshua told his Talmudin, his disciples, that's you. So he's telling this to us. Some of us learned this 25 years in our faith, right? But this should be day one. This should be before we sign on. This should be before day one. This is a prerequisite to saying, I believe, and anyone wants to come after me. If you want to come after me, what is he saying? You want to be my follower. If you want to call yourself a Christian, let him say no to himself. Now, is that self-denial? No, it's not self-denial. It's denying yourself. Self-denial is I'll give up chocolate for Lent. Denying yourself is saying, I have no inalienable rights. Now, you remember my friend Samuel. You remember what he said. Take out a piece of paper and write down in the course of the day the amount of time you spend thinking about yourself and your needs and your desires and what you want, even if they're ministerial. Well, I want to go to India. Still you. It's still you. And then put on the other page how much time you spend thinking about others. It's astounding. It's astounding how self-absorbed we've become. He says, deny yourself. If you want to follow me, you've got to deny yourself. You've got to take up the execution stake, meaning you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer and keep following me. That's the only way you can keep following me, and this is going to be continual. If whoever wants to save his own life will destroy it. Destroy it. But whoever destroys his life for my sake will find it. Man, that is so, that is so unbelievably powerful. What he's saying is it's not going to be a primrose path. Not necessarily what we hear today, per se, but okay. First Maccabees 3, 17 through 19, but as soon as they, these saw the force advancing to meet them, they said to Judas, so now Mattiaho took out a little sword he had and just drove it right through the commander at Moedim. The palace just drove right through. And then out of nowhere, his sons came and just devastated the troop. And, you know, it was on. They were going to get word back, you know. The commanders didn't go, you believe what these Jews did. They're not giving in, man. And they went into caves and set up networks and taught how to fight with rocks. They made sharp rocks. Crazy. For years this went on. And then when he died, his son took over, Judah, the Maccabee. And it says, but as soon as... These saw the force advancing to meet them. They said to Judas, because now they, they, they went back, they gave the report, and hey, they're going to bring, you know what I'm saying? They're going to bring the cavalry to that little town, and they're going to kill everybody in that town. Look what you did. If we would have just bowed down, if we would have just bowed down, now look what you did. Look, you opened up a can of worms. Now they're going to kill us. How good, was that smart? They said to Judas, this is what they asked him in Modim, how can we, few as we are, engage such overwhelming numbers. What are we going to do, Judas? It's, it's, thanks a lot. We are exhausted as it is. They've been fighting, and they're exhausted. They have nothing left, nothing. Not having had anything to eat today. Imagine. It's easy. Imagine. I'm sure he didn't say it like that. But look at the response. It's easy, Judas answered. For a great number to be defeated by a few. Indeed, in the sight of heaven, deliverance, whether by many or by few, is all one. 
For victory in war does not depend on the size of the fighting force. Heaven accords the strength. It is not extra biblical. He knew what Moses knew. Look at Exodus 14, 13 through 14. Moshe answered the people. They were saying the same thing. What are we going to do? Stop being so fearful. Remain steady. You will see how Adonai is going to save you. He will do it today. Today you have seen the Egyptians, but you will never see them again. Adonai will battle for you. Just calm yourselves down. Judas knew what Moses knew. He knew what Gideon knew. I mean, how, how powerful was Gideon? Look at Judges 6. Adonai turned to him and said, Go in this strength of yours and save Israel from the hands of Midian. Midian? How many? 132,000, give or take? Same, same situation. Haven't I sent you? God's saying, Gideon, I sent you. If I, if I appointed you, then I anointed you. But Gideon answered him, forgive me, my Lord, but with what am I to save Israel? Why, my family is the poorest in Manasseh, of the tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the youngest person in the, my father's house. You pick the worst tribe, the worst family, and the worst member of the family. <laughs> Adonai said to him, because I will be with you, you will strike down Midian as easily if they were one man. Judas knew what Moses knew. Judas knew what Gideon knew. Judas knew what King David knew. 1 Samuel 17, 45, 47. David answered the Philistines, You're coming at me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I'm coming at you in the name of Adonai Tzavot, the Lord of heaven's armies. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have challenged, today Adonai will hand you over to me. You're a little kid with red hair, you nuts. I will attack you. I will lop off your head. I'll give the carcasses of the army to the Philistines, to the birds in the air and the animals of the land. Then all Israel will know. Do you follow what it's the reason for? It's not just to glorify God. It's to save the Jewish people from assimilating. It's to wake them up. Then all the land will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that Adonai does not save by sword or spear. For this is Adonai's battle. And he will hand you over to us. Last but not least, they knew what King Hezekiah knew when he went against the Assyrians. 2 Chronicles 32, 7, 8. Be strong. Take courage. Don't be afraid or distressed on account of the king of Asher, Syria, or all the horde he brings with him, a million people. For the one with us is greater than the one with him. He has human strength, but we have Adonai, our God, to help us and fight our battles. The people took to heart of the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. You realize what was at stake Lady, do you realize what was at stake if these Jews assimilated? You'd be cutting yourself and throwing your kids to the fire. There would be no Christmas. They would not be looking for the king of the Jews because there would be no Jews. There would be no deliverer. Hawk the herald angels wouldn't be singing. Silent night would be incredibly silent. Do you realize that what these people have gone through for your benefit? How could you be ambivalent? How could you be neutral? How could you not be a legitimate Christian? Let me leave you with a quote. The Jews maintain that there are things in this life that are worth dying for. Things that are more meaningful than life itself. Jews are not willing to give up their lives. Jews are willing to give up their lives for Judaism. Not because God needs people to die for him, but because the ideology of Torah is something without which humanity is doomed. Mattathias, Mattiahu, knew that he was called and his people were called, not his family, but the Jewish people were called to be a light to the nations. They brought the gospel to the world, Right? We know the Apostle Paul was very Jewish, he was a Pharisee, and he was the Apostle to the Gentiles. They knew that if they assimilated, that light would be snuffed out, and they could not abandon their mission even if their lives were at stake. The crazy question I have is, they didn't know Yeshua. All they were willing to die for was the commandments of God because they knew future generations would suffer without it. Yes. Humanity would suffer without the word of God. There would be no light and they wouldn't let their light get snuffed out. Here we are, 2,000 years 
on the other side of the cross will we'll be dedicated? Will we be Maccabees when we're called to be? Happy Hanukkah. Let's stand up together. As I said to you, Dwayne DiFilippo will be at the helm next week. I'll be at the conference. Um, I'd really rather be here, to be perfectly frank. But um, this is something that, that I have to do um, to maintain our covering. So I go once a year. There's another conference I can go to in Pennsylvania, which is a national conference, which my kids would love. But it would mean I'd be gone for almost two weeks, and it's, it's just I'm, I just don't feel... Uh, that is necessary per se, even though it's a wonderful conference as well. Um, but I will catch you on December 26th, and we'll continue talking about Hanukkah, and 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 a little get a little deeper into the message and what it's all about. And we might even talk about Christmas. Who knows? We'll see what 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 God has in store for us. Okay. Um, um, enjoy the rest of the holy day, and and again, I um, I'm not apt to tell the Christian community what they have to do. Um, it's not my place. It's my place to, to, to share and, and teach as best as I can. I don't know how well I do. That's, that's up for God to tell me when I meet him. Um, the word of God, and then let it fall where it may. And then you guys are big girls and big boys, and you make your decisions. But see how Mattathias wasn't worried about what all the nations were doing? See how Mattathias wasn't worried about what the leaders in Jerusalem were doing? He just said, as far as me and my household... Sound familiar? That's good enough, isn't it? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace in the name of the Prince of all Peace, Yeshua. Viasem lecha shalom. Shabbat shalom, Chag Sameach.